Friends, sink more deeply into your chair. Relax the muscles in your body. Slow your breathing, bringing as you are able, air in through your nose and out through your mouth. Let us take three long breaths together. Think about the word renewal. What definitions come up for you? What images does this word conjure? Notice any feelings that are emerging. If you will adopt an attitude of prayer. Spirit of life and love, thank you for this beautiful day. We are grateful for the firefighters and volunteers and other first responders in our state who have been working so hard to Contain the fires, fight the fires, and be with those who have been hurt. We are grateful to those who protest injustice and hope that they stay safe. We pray for those who are in positions of leadership within our communities, our state, and our nation, that they may keep the needs of all within their realm of influence as the highest priority as they make decisions. Be with us as we make decisions each day about how best to show up for ourselves and for each other. We ask for all of this in a spirit of love and compassion. Amen. When I think about the word renewal, I think of my father, the farmer. My dad grew up on a farm and although he did a bunch of things after he graduated high school, everything from being a vet assistant to being a manager of a farm supply store, somehow he always went back to farming in some way. When we lived in Mansfield, Ohio, he sold life insurance as his day job, but on the weekends, he was out puttering in the garden. I worked in the garden a tiny bit, and he would tell me what it was like growing up on a farm. He told me that growing up, he was taught to change what was growing in a field every three years. If you had corn in a field for three years, at the end of that time, you, you would choose to something else to plant there, like wheat or soybeans. Different plants would use different parts of the soil, thus elongating how long one could plant and still get a decent yield. Every seven years, a good farmer, according to my dad and my memory, would leave the field fallow for a year to regenerate the nutrients in the soil. They would till the remainders of the harvest in the, into the earth and plant something innocuous as ground cover, leaving the field alone for the year. If you think about it, teachers and professional fields use this same kind of idea when they talk about sabbaticals. Every so often, the person takes some time off and concentrates on something a bit different. The theory goes that the time away allows for rest, the chance to investigate something, some new way of looking at whatever the person's passion is, and it allows for a different kind of rhythm to emerge. When COVID-19 first struck last spring, 
people of a certain economic persuasion talked about using this time like a sabbatical. Lynn Unger in her poem, Pandemic, writes, what if you thought of it as the Jews consider the Sabbath, the most sacred of times? Cease from travel, cease from buying and selling, give up just for now on trying to make the world different than it is. Sing, pray, touch only those to whom you commit your life. Center down. Now, I recognize that for some, this doesn't fit. After all, sabbaticals are planned. Allowing a field to go fallow is planned. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I had no plans for a pandemic in 2020. More importantly, for those whose cash flow has been interrupted or worse stopped, I imagine that thinking about this mess like it is sacred would feel like fingernails on a chalkboard. I've noticed that people seem to generally fall in one of two fields during this time. Those that are working their tail feathers off and are generally quite stressed. Most ministers and parents of small children that I know seem to fall in this category. And those that are feeling the spaciousness that this time can afford. Many retired folks seem to show up here. The folks in the latter category tell me that one day seems like the next. And sometimes I even hear these folks say, they're a little bored. What all this tells me is that COVID not only affects our day to day, it also affects things like how we might go about renewing ourselves. It's more complex than simply leaning into this time. So let me take a completely different approach. I was listening to Dr. Brene Brown, a sociologist who studies shame and vulnerability. If you've heard me speak more than three times, chances are you have heard me refer to her once before. Her research somehow seems to be lockstep with my lived experience. Dr. Brown talked in her podcast, Unlocking Us, about how we're in a space with COVID-19 and, and with the racial equity discussions, frankly, that is analogous to the second act of a three act play. In the first act, the characters are introduced and we get to see the rhythms of their life and the rules and the protocols that they use to order their life. Then at the end of the first act, something happens. The antagonist stirs up some kind of trouble. In the second act, the hero tries to solve the issue. Now, oftentimes the hero goes for the easy fix first the way around the problem, the one that won't cause the character of the hero to be questioned or smirched. In Dr. Brown's language, these are solutions that avoid vulnerability and shame. Let's take an example. In the film, It's a Wonderful Life, Uncle B Billy loses his deposit talking to Mr. Potter, the antagonist at the end of act one. George Bailey, the protagonist, first tries to retrace Uncle Billy's steps hoping the money is going to magically turn up somehow. And then he goes to Potter and asks for a loan. Now, this may seem like vulnerability, right? I mean, George is lowering himself before Potter, who is the antagonist. But it's a bit of a dodge because George is lowering himself before one man in order to prevent the possibility that the whole town will see him as a thief. Finally, in the third act, with the help of the angels, Clarence, George sees the impact of it, that his life has had on other people. And he realizes that the only way through this mess is to come clean and say what is. This requires true vulnerability. This process is also sometimes referred to as the hero's journey, citing professor and writer Joseph Campbell. Whatever you call it, what is true is that in order to get through a crazy situation, we often have to get vulnerable in order to find the solution that will work. What is true is that we find ourselves in unprecedented times trying to figure out how to move forward in ways that keep us safe and don't screw those who are most at risk. And according to Dr. Brown, it's just about to get a little worse. 
Brene Brown posits that the day after Labor Day in this country is our true New Year. It's the time of year when we try to get back to normal. Kids typically go back to school. It's often when job searches earnestly kick off. It's the time of year when we establish patterns that last throughout the rest of the academic year, like in terms of our kids and in, in terms of watching TV, in terms of how and when we eat. Dr. Brown predicts that our desire to get back to normal will override our knowledge that safety measures are important. And indeed, this weekend, there have already been record numbers of people getting together. I would add to this that in California, the addition of the fires and smoke add an overwhelm, which I find lowers my ability to remember all the rules of the game. All of a sudden, I find myself having to go back into the house or the car and get my mask. All of a sudden, I want to say, the heck with it. I just need that hug from my best friend. And we are about to start the flu season. So my friends, I'm sorry to be Miss Debbie Downer here, but we are either squarely in or about to be in the second act of this play. Now, the longer you've been around, the more stories you have seen, heard, and experienced. We know what happens next. We're already doing the dance, right? Socially distancing, physically, while trying to emotionally stay connected. Wearing our masks and trying to convince those who have politicized the practice to, to pay attention to the science and the trends. Doing it well for a bit, and then kind of backing off the rules and finding the numbers going up. We are trying the easy things, even though they don't feel very easy. I think that Dr. Brown brings two renewal pieces into this conversation. First, we have each had many hero's journeys that we've lived through. Heck, some of us have had major hero's journeys that we've lived through. And although living through one does not, according to Brene, give us easy passage through the next hero's journey. It does remind us that if we stay the course, we will get through this. Let me repeat that. Our life experience tells us that if we stay the course, we will get through this. Second, we know that this process requires us to get more vulnerable. So how? How in this hard moment can we get more honest and be more human? What do we need to ask for? And maybe even more importantly, what do we need to hear in what other people ask for? Is there a way in which listening below the surface can assist us in getting through all of this? Dr. Brown in other books and podcasts suggests that we do four things that allow us to get more vulnerable. Number one, we name what is happening. Just say out loud what our experience is. Number two, we normalize what is happening. We remind ourselves that we are right where we are supposed to be. Number three, we put it into perspective. We remind ourselves of the broader context in which we find ourselves. And four, we reality check our experience. Given the context, what is realistic moving forward? So the next time you find yourself frustrated that the board won't allow the church to meet or that your Aunt Dorothy is making unsafe choices that she, when she meets her girlfriends to play canasta, or that your partner is spending money on crazy crap. And honestly, my husband probably would say that more about me than I could say it about him. <laughs> when you're in those situations, name the situation. Aunt Dorothy, I noticed you're getting together with your girlfriends twice a week to play canasta. And, and I find myself really scared because I'm afraid that you're risking higher exposure. 
normalize it. These are crazy times. I imagine it must be hard to live alone when you can't touch others. And, and I know I find it so hard not knowing how long we're going to have to use these rules. It's perfectly understandable your need to see people. Put it into perspective. On the one hand, I know science has proved that the broader our bubbles are, the more likely we are to get sick. And, and, and the broadness of our bubbles, I mean, it's not just who we see, but it's also who each of those people see. On the other hand, I want you to have what you need. I want you to have a fulfilling life. Reality check our experience. I just wonder, is there a way for you to see your friends, but I don't know, maybe do an activity together that keeps you a little further apart? Or maybe you could play outside. I, I do hope you're wearing your mask the whole time. And as you hear Aunt Dorothy's response, can you listen under what is actually being said? If, if Aunt Dorothy responds angry, angrily, that you need to mind your own bleeping business, can you curb the getting offended response and hear that she too is scared? She too is angry. She too has needs and desires. She too is just trying to find a way forward, one that allows her to maintain her sanity while preserving her health. Because if we can get to that conversation, I think we'll feel more at ease. I think we will feel more connected. I think we will feel more renewed. The only way to move my friends is forward. But I need your help. And I think you need mine. So come take my hand, metaphorically, of course. And maybe we can help each other. Amen.